My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might, or human wisdom's fleeting light. But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. To wonders here that I confess my worth in my unworthiness my value fixed my ransom paid at the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer greatest treasure wellspring of my soul I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him song. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you promised to satisfy us and to fill us. We thank you that you, uh, you care for us. This morning, as we come here to sing, to fellowship, to be in your word, to pray, would you just soften our hearts and prepare us um, to be changed? Um, would you give us a heart that loves the people next to us and is humble to you? Just change us, Lord, so that when we leave here, uh, we will be different than when we came. In your name we pray. Amen. You can all be seated. Folks, I'm so glad to see you this morning. It is a uh, beautiful, beautiful cold day. Uh, thankfully, this morning I have only a couple announcements. Um, downstairs on the post, uh, one of the two posts going into the fellowship hall, there are two sign-up sheets um, last two weeks, we've started up youth group and a Hapwa, and uh, there's sheets with dates for the rest of this spring semester um, for snacks. So if you would like to bring a snack for either one of those, you can sign up on that, cause, and we would appreciate that, because uh, snacks are great. Um, second, second thing, very quickly, last week, Mark Gasso came up, and he is not here, so I can't congratulate him, but... He shared some new additions to the library, and I just, Kennedy and I watched uh, this movie last night, actually, and it was uh, amazing. It was so much better than I was expecting. 
Um, so if you're someone that enjoys learning, um, talk to Mark. Go check out the library. He's always got new things, and he's trying to move things around so that we can go in there and make use of that. So that is a resource, and uh, we found it really good. So uh, Dismantle. It deals with um, science and genetics. Talks about uh, different types of snakes and piebalds. And, oh, no, that was, never mind, that's Mark. Never mind. But it's, it's something that would be right up your alley. And last thing, um, we are going to be doing communion at the end of the service. So if you have not grabbed one of the cups, there are some either in the back or downstairs. So now is a great time to do that. Please stand for the reading of Scripture today as we look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you were formerly walked according to the curse of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too form, all formerly lived in the lust of our fleshes, indulging in desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, by that amazing grace. forever 
enough. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember Do you believe that this morning? If so, why don't you say amen with me? Yeah. Amen. His grace is enough. And um, where would we be without it, right? The grace of God. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's his gift. We don't merit it in any way. But we gather together to praise him and to thank him for that. And um, what a blessing it is to be able to be back with you. <clears throat> Had a couple of... Very enjoyable weeks, refreshing and um, relaxing. Patty and I were able to spend a couple of weeks in Florida with her sister for a lot of that. And then I did head up north and spend a little bit of time with uh, John <clears throat> Bauman and Doug and Mickey Finch and a little bit of time with Jerry and Sandy Valone. And they all send their greetings. For those of us that know them, um, they wanted you to know that um, they wanted me to say hi, and um, especially when I was talking with Jerry for a little bit, because, you know, they've moved up to Farmington when they're back here. We don't see them here as often. He really spoke very fondly about God's 
using this church in his life. And so what a blessing it was to visit with them for a little bit, and um, they do send their greetings. Uh, it was a little difficult, um, you know, the day before we left, I think it was 84 degrees. Um, we did take some cold weather with us. If you were watching the weather, we took it down into the 30s down in Florida, broke some records while we were there. <clears throat> but it was in the 80s, the day before we left. And when Patty and I got on the plane yesterday to fly back, uh, the captain said as we were getting ready to take off, it was eight degrees in Rochester. A little different, you know. Um, in fact, uh, a couple of our sons got the vehicle stuck in our driveway, as you can imagine. And boy, Jake plowed on Friday, for which they put the plow on my truck. And there, it's, there's a lot of snow up that way, you know. Um, but it was a very wonderful opportunity for us to be away for a couple of weeks and relax and, and spend time with friends and especially for Patty to spend some time with her sister. And I did as well. And it was a great blessing. So thanks for your prayers. Thank you, Nate. Uh, I was able to watch you both times. I tried to do it live and I'm just not tech savvy enough. Bob, I should have reached out to you to figure out how to do it. So instead, I just watched him <clears throat> on the website. And I appreciate you sharing about... Um, Abraham and Joseph and Judah and Jesus, and um, thank you very much for your faithfulness there. And what a blessing to get together. And I just want to, right before we pray, not only thank you for your prayers, and uh, really, it's, it's wonderful to be back, you know. A couple of weeks was a long time for, I was ready a few days ago to head back. <clears throat> and um, what a blessing to be here and to see all of you folks and to to be able to worship and study God's word together. But right before we go to the Lord in prayer, I just want to mention a few things that many of you have probably heard over the last few weeks, but maybe some of you haven't. When we were at Patty's sister, not last week when I was there, but the week before, got a text from Priscilla Trojan that Joe Shibley had passed away. And um, just be praying for for Priscilla and, and Jody and Joe's family and uh, just the, the challenges there, the transitions of losing loved ones. When I say Joe's name, something probably automatically comes to mind in most of your eyes. If you're thinking about any fellowship dinner or cakewalk, something about Joe, what do you think about? Cookies. cookies. She made some of the delicious sugar cookies and, and it was a privilege for me to be involved in seeing her come to faith in Christ and the privilege of baptizing her at um, Brad and Linda's pond at a backyard gathering. And, you know, she's home with the Lord. And what a blessing to know that. Um, it's good for me to see Bob and Sue Carlson. We've been praying for you, brother, and to see your granddaughter Bella's here, too. <clears throat> and we're just going to keep trusting God with you, right? One step at a time. Um, praying for his healing in his way and in his will, however he sees fit, to him be the glory. And um, we love you guys and been praying for you, and we'll continue to do that as well, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a blessing to gather together with your people, and we thank you this morning for that bond of love that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ that unites us together as family in Christ. We admit, as we've sung already this morning, it's only by your grace. None of us are smart enough or good enough. We can't earn it or, or win it, deserve it in any way. It's your gift to us, and, and we're so grateful for that grace in our lives. We thank you for the gift of faith that your son was willing to, to leave heaven's glory and, and come to a world that had turned his back on him and, and to live a life of complete obedience. Never once did he sin. He never acted independent of you. And, and that led him to the cross where he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin on our behalf. He, he took our place as our substitute. And we want to remember that today, Jesus. A little later, as we take the bread and drink the cup, we want to remember the price that was paid to redeem us. We sang of that this morning as well. And 
that our chains are gone. And that's by your amazing grace and through your sacrifice for us, your willingness to, to take the punishment for our sin. To, to bear the, the righteous anger, the, the wrath of a holy God in our place so that we might become the righteousness of God in you, Jesus. That's what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5. And we're so grateful for that. And we pray that our hearts, even now, as we've been preparing to take the Lord's Supper, Father, may each of us continue or at least now begin to examine so that as we take the bread and drink the cup, we can truly do it with, with thankfulness in our hearts in remembrance of you, Jesus. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you personally yet, that has never trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord, we pray that your spirit would convict and draw and use your word as we teach and preach it this morning. And as it's alive and active and sharper than a, a two-edged sword, may it pierce right through into the inward part of that one that doesn't know you and, and show them their need of a Savior. And I pray, Father, that right where they sit, they would admit that they need to be rescued because they admit that they've sinned and fallen short of your glory. And, and they would believe that Jesus died and rose again for them. They depend on him to, to rescue them. They'd call out to him to save them, to deliver them. And, and as we look in the Old Testament and, and see pictures of that, thousands of years before Jesus came, the, the promised Christ, may our hearts be open and responsive so that as we gather together, we'll understand in taking these elements, it's not any way to win your favor or to somehow earn it or deserve it. It's because you've already graced us with that. You've forgiven us of sin, made us brand new. You've delivered us and made us your children. Your spirit has taken up residency within us. Jesus, your, your son, the second person of the Godhead, is, has become our life. We've been crucified with him. We no longer live. Christ lives in us. And Father, for those of us that know you, may we truly live by faith. As Paul reminded the Galatians, this life that we live now, we live by faith. Trusting, depending Resting moment by moment, day by day, in Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you that you make a real difference in our life. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just so that we can be moral or ethical. Thank you that it does bring change like that. But it's total transformation from the inside out. And Father, we confess right now that we need you to keep working in our lives. As we come together as a body, there are many needs represented here. Some of them are, are physical needs, maybe for healing, maybe financially. Some of them are decisions that need to be made. Maybe there's confusion or, or difficulty or hardship. And maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's spiritual or emotional. Father, whatever the need, we bring those together right now and we just hurl them on you. We cast them on you knowing that you care for us. And we're so grateful you don't leave us. You don't forsake us. And neither do you waste the things through which you take us. So, Father, I pray that not only that your grace would be sufficient as it is, it's enough. But I pray that each of us, as we go through those trials and tribulations, as we go through those exciting and joyous times of, of success and, and, and excellence, Father, and prosperity that you provide, not that you promise, but that you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Jesus, no matter where we are, that we would trust in you and believe that you're using it for our good, even if it is difficult and hard. So, Father, with that in mind, we, we bring these special needs that we've mentioned before you for the Shibley family, for Priscilla and Jody, and for all of us. We, we miss Joe, and, 
And we just thank you for her salvation. And we just pray for your comfort and your peace that passes understanding, that it would guard the, the hearts and minds of, of her loved ones and her family. Father, we, we pray for the Carlsons and we pray for your, your healing hand, for wisdom, for those that will be waiting on him and prescribing things and the direction and your guidance. And, and Father, we know that you are the God of miracles. We're going to see them in your word again this morning. But we're also going to see that you're the, the God that challenges us to wait on you and to be patient and to trust you. Because you never fail, you are absolutely faithful. And so we pray that you would draw them close to you through this challenging time. And in each of these situations, as well as the other needs that we don't even know about right now, but maybe we'll find out about them in the next day or two, help us to reach out in in ways to, to encourage and to comfort, to sacrifice and to share. We pray that you just continue to unite this body for your glory. Thank you for the privilege of gathering in this time in your word. Open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to understand and respond. Transform us, Holy Spirit. Change us. Humble us. Teach us and guide us. And draw us to Jesus, for we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, Nate, for keeping the the story going. You know, at the beginning of the year, we began with the theme to, to read the Bible through in 2022 and find God's worldview for you. And and so we've been doing our best to kind of stay up. And you say, wait a minute, Mark, uh, I'm way up into the book of Leviticus. If you're on track, you're already reading in Leviticus. And and I know you'd like to read Leviticus for the rest of the year, probably. Um, I've been staying up with it as well. And um, and I'm excited to actually get to Leviticus, but we're not going to get there today. Um, Leviticus was written by the man, by the, humanly, by a man by the name of Moses. In fact, these first five books of the Old Testament are written by Moses. Um, uh, Really written by the Holy Spirit as he moves Moses along to write truth, as Moses is inspired by, by God to write exactly what God wants him to write, and so what he writes is truth. And yet we've tried to explain that Moses wrote this thousands of years later, and the Holy Spirit inspires him. Much of that has been passed on through word of mouth, through the the family units. And and, and so Moses understands some of the history and things, and and he's actually going to live it from the point on where we arrive today. We're going to spend some time discussing Moses today and and, and God's calling in his life. Um, but eventually, and it's probably going to be even much later than what we studied today, it's going to be at least months and maybe a year or two later, and maybe for some of it, it's going to be even 40 years later beyond this. If you know, if you've been tracking, you know what the book of Numbers is going to emphasize, that they don't take God at his word, and, and God's people are going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and we know that Deuteronomy is written on the basically getting ready to go into the Holy Land, and it's a brand new generation of God's people because anybody 20 years and older has died in the wilderness. And so Deuteronomy is recounting the law again. Moses is directed by God for this brand new generation, these These young people, many of them did not experience the events that we're going to read about this morning. It's the new generation of of God's people. and, And Moses wants them to remember God's presence in their life. And so it... We know it's the month before they go in because Deuteronomy tells us that's when Moses wrote that. And and so my point in in, in sharing that is that Moses is the human author and God has revealed to him and has moved him along by the Holy Spirit to write the truth. Moses was not there when God created the world. Do you remember? Moses was not there when Abraham was born. 
nor Isaac, nor Jacob, nor Joseph and Judah. He was not there. But that doesn't mean the account is not accurate. It's absolutely true and accurate because it comes from God through the human agent of Moses. And I want us to understand that some of that information has been passed on from family unit to family unit. They understood, the, the, the nation of Israel understood that God had promised Abraham a tremendous blessing and that Abraham didn't earn it. It was by grace through faith. And, and it's clear that Abraham didn't earn his relationship with God. When I was a kid, I used to think that Abraham became righteous with God by keeping the Ten Commandments. He's laughing. They weren't written for over 400 years later. He couldn't have kept them. Do you understand? He didn't earn God's favor. God spoke to him, revealed himself to him, and, and Abraham believed him. That's what the text tells us. And it was credited to his account as righteousness. He took God that's, at his word. That's faith. That's the only way to have a relationship with God from the beginning to the end, throughout all eternity. We don't earn it. It's not by works. It's not by being religious. It's not by taking the Lord's Supper. It's not by being baptized or being here today or reading your Bible. All good things. Do you understand? But they all fall short if you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And so the, the beauty of what we're tracing as we read the Bible through, and no, it won't correspond every week with where you're reading. You might be ahead in reading. <clears throat> if you've looked ahead, it's not until the first Sunday in March or the second Sunday in March when we finally get to the next major person that we're going to discuss. And that's Joshua. So I've got a few weeks to cover <laughs> Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You know, because the next book after that is Joshua. But the, the next significant individual is Moses. If you're tracking with us in this Old Testament survey, the big picture, you know, the Anna, Jim, JJK, split crisscross OT survey. Some of you are saying it with me and we'll, down the road, we'll teach you more and more of it. But it's a big picture of the major events of the Old Testament. Anna, a necrostic. A Adam, Noah, Abraham. We've discussed those. The Jim is an abbreviated JM for abbreviation for Jim. And that's Joseph. A little bit of Judah, we'll say, because we, Nate included him last week. Uh, I'm teasing. But Joseph is going to be instrumental in getting the nation of Israel to Egypt, this big incubator for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham. When they come down to, to, to Egypt, it's about 70 people from, from Jacob's loins, his descendants with their wives, their children that come down there. And Joseph is used by God to get them there. 430 years later, two to three million of them leave. And that's what God had promised Abraham. He said, your descendants would be as the sand of the seas. I spent a little time on the beach this last couple weeks. And I picked up a bunch of seashells, and there were billions of seashells. But guess what? There's a whole lot more sand grains. Grains of sand and stars in the sky. And, and, and God's promise was you're not going to be able to count them, Abraham, when they come down to Egypt. As Nate was teaching about Joseph, as God gets him there, it's a family unit, right? It's a starting of a tribe. There's not a bunch of them there. When they leave 430 years later, it's a nation. It's a people of God like he promised. And this stuff gets exciting as we put it together. So the, the J of Jim is Joseph. The M is Moses. And then we'll look at JJK, it'll be after Moses and they get into the land. It'll be Joshua that leads them into the land for the first J. The next J will be judges, as God uses the judges to rule his people in the land like he promised. And then they cry out for something. What do they want? They want to be just like everybody else. And so give us a king, the kingdom period. And it's united at the beginning, but eventually it divides, the split is a northern and a southern kingdom of the people of God. 
Both of them don't take God at his word. They don't trust him. They're not following in faith and obedience. And it's going to lead to God disciplining them because he loves them too much to let them keep going that way. The Assyrians are going to basically, basically obliterate the northern ten tribes. And a few years later, the Babylonians are going to carry Benjamin and Judah into captivity. And God's going to bring them back to himself. And that's the, 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 the split and the, the crisscross stands for C for captivity. The, that's kind of the, the crisscross. And then there's going to be an R, return. God's going to bring them back to the land. And then crisscross, an abbreviation, it's kind of like this, a crisscross, the C, captivity, R, return. The S is, I'm not going to tell you. It's Silence. 400 years of silence only to be broken by John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet, saying, get ready, turn. My son says it, his, his message was turn or burn. His message was you need to repent and get ready because Messiah is right here. And that's our Old Testament. That's where we're going. And that's the big picture. And you're reading along and we're doing this together. But it's not just so that we can have this information in our head. It's so that we can see God's purpose for our lives, his heart revealed to us, his worldview. How do I make decisions in a world that is lost and separated from him? And I want us to see that as we, we look at the, the, the people of God that he's raising up in Egypt. Egypt was the powerhouse back then. And they worshipped a bunch of gods and goddesses, little g. And it impacted the nation of Israel. They weren't, as they're growing there, you don't see anything until they finally leave Egypt about this organized worship of God. Do you understand? And then when Moses is up on the, the mountain with God receiving the Ten Commandments, if you remember, and he's coming down with the law, they get a little antsy. He's been up there a long time, right? So what do they do? They revert back to their old influences from Egypt. They make a calf. Um, um, they take their gold and their earrings and they put it together and they fashion this and they begin to worship a cow, this calf, the golden calf. Do you see, God's people are always instructed to be in the world, but not of it. It's influences all around us. Sometimes it's gradual, it's always subtle, it's very deceptive. But as we're studying and seeing God's big picture, we need to evaluate and examine my life. Who's calling the shots? God and his word? Or the success of the people around me and the push at my work and at my school and my friends who don't know God and the direction they have and all the stuff that looks good. That's the difference. We're reading to understand so that we can see, change me, God, right? And that's the beauty of where we're going in this study. And so we're on to this guy, you know, I thought about starting with, you know, some of those fun stories you love from me, you know. The, you like my jokes, I know, but, you know, some of them you think, man, those jokes of Marx, you know. You know, they're as old as Moses' toes and twice as corny. Um, it, it, Oh, well, that was pretty good. That's when Moses toes twice as corn, you know. You know, I got to thinking about it. Moses was a very current individual in his time. He really was. He was the first man to get a tablet with data from the cloud. <laughs> you, you know, think about it. He, he really was. And I got to thinking while I was down there relaxing, you know, for a little bit. He, he actually got two tablets, you know, and a lot of data from the cloud. You'll see that when we get there, the presence of God was represented in this cloud of Shekinah glory and at night a fire, a shining. And anyway, I don't, if I have to explain it, it's never mind. Um, but I did think a little bit about that this morning. I was wondering, you know, how do you think Moses, you know, made his coffee? He brews it, right? He, he, he brews it. Um, turn with me um, while you're laughing so hard to Genesis chapter 50. It's 
where Nate kind of left off, the end of Genesis ends with the death of Jacob. Um, the, he has the 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And, and, and as he, he dies, he, he asks his sons to take his bones back to Canaan. He doesn't want to be buried in Egypt because God has miraculously delivered them by Joseph, this son that they abused and mistreated and, and persecuted. God has used him to preserve and to prosper them, to, to bring them in the famine to Egypt. And Jacob lives there for a number of years, and as he dies, he says, when I do take my bones, and they did that. That's the first few verses. So, you know, as you keep reading, then after Jacob has died, his sons, Joseph's brothers, think, well, jeepers, you know, as long as Jacob was alive, Joseph wouldn't do anything to us. But now that he's gone, maybe he's going to get even for all how we poorly treated them. And so they come to Joseph and say, you know, dad told you, don't do that. Keep care and we'll be your servants. Just don't. They were afraid of Joseph. Remember, they had sold him into slavery and things. They and they had oppressed and, and ridiculed him. And now God has used Joseph to deliver them, and Jacob's gone, dad's gone, what are they going to do? Well, well, here's the response, you know, as they're afraid, and they, they say maybe something's going to happen, and this is Joseph's response to them. Look at verse 19. But Joseph said to them, this is Genesis 50, do not be afraid, for I am, in, am I in God's place? He's basically saying, am I God? Verse 20, and don't you love this? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Folks, I want us to, you go through some difficult times in life like pastors do from time to time. Hardship, things you don't like, things that are bad, that are evil, that are wrong. We all face it, right? Do you think God's sleeping during that time? Do you, do you think he just doesn't really care? Do you think he has too many things going on? He can't keep track of it, right? None of those things are true. God even uses bad and evil and difficult things in our life to bring about good. That's part of who he is, his nature. And you don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss it in Joseph and his brother's lives, and you don't want to miss it. It's still true today that he can use evil and difficult and hardship. In fact, most of us will agree, especially looking back, I grew most during the hard times. I trusted him more. I learned things that I needed. I never would have learned if it was easy street. And I began to coast. And as you know, coasting in any time means you got to go downhill. Challenges shake us and wake us. And it's important for us to see it. And so that's the end, basically. Joseph dies. He makes his brothers promise that when you go to the Holy Land, you take my bones with you. Don't leave them here in Egypt. Yes, I was used by God in Egypt to preserve and to prosper the family. But when you get the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and, and dad, Jacob, and his confidence, his faith. In fact, if, if you read Hebrews eleven twenty seven, 27, that's why he's in the hall of faith. Because he took God at his word and he said, take my bones with me when, with you and bury them in the promised land. Don't leave me here. He trusted God. And as you read through this passage, through the thing, as you already have, you'll, event, you haven't gotten there yet, but when you get into Joshua, you're going to find that they do it. And so that's the end of, of, of Genesis. God has used Joseph to get him there. Remember, he's in second in charge. He's in a favorable place. It's the, the seat of power in the world there. Not only military might, but culture and education. Everything was drawn to Egypt. And, and that's where God's people are. Seventy men come down. And what's going to happen over those 430 years there? there? Look with me at Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Now, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. 
They came each one with his household, and it lists the, the 12 sons there. And as you jump down to verse 5, all the persons who came, 70 in number, Joseph was already there in Egypt. Joseph died, verse 6, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful, verse 7, increased greatly and multiplied. They became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. God's promise is coming true. They're in Egypt, a place of prosperity, a place of blessing and abundance. And they're multiplying like crazy. Verse 8, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It's a pretty important verse in Exodus. Didn't remember how much Joseph was used to bless Egypt, let alone God's family, to keep them alive during the famine, right? And the plans and the preparation. God used Joseph tremendously in Egypt's life. And now it's years later, and a new king who doesn't remember, doesn't know, doesn't care about Joseph. And what does he do? In verse 9, he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them or else they'll multiply and in the event of war, they'll join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. They'll join our enemies, fight against us and they'll be free and we'll lose their, their influence and their labor and all their workforce. So they appointed taskmasters over them, verse 11, to afflict them with hard labor. They built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field and their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. And so we see what's happening. It's hundreds of years later. We're going to come eventually to discover. Uh, eventually, we're going to be about 430 years later. Okay? Interesting, because way back in Genesis 15, that's what God promised Abraham. When he told him land, seed, and blessing, and he told him about the history to come, he says they're going to be there for over 400 years. I'm going to raise up my people. This is hundreds of years before. God knew it was his plan for his people. And there's some other things he's going to say. Not only is he going to get them out, he's, he says, you're going to plunder them when you leave. When I rescue you from Egypt, from the slavery and hardship you're experiencing, I'm going to bless your socks off. They didn't have socks. They had sandals probably back then. But you get the picture, right? It's just going to be a tremendous time. And so what we start seeing here is now we're in Egypt, it's hundreds of years later, and if you were to continue to read in chapter 1 as you did probably a number of weeks ago and you're reading through, you're going to find that as you get to chapter 2, what's going to happen is it's not working, so the Pharaoh's going to say, start to the midwives, kill the male babies of the Hebrew children. Because it doesn't happen. God providentially is raising up his people. And humanly, Egypt is trying to stop it. And it's not working. You get it? And along that time, just happened to happen, as luck would have it, coincidentally, nah. By the providential, sovereign hand of God, as you start into to chapter 2, you read about a birth of a little baby boy named Moses. And his mom won't throw him in the river Nile like they were instructed and said, she does put him in the river, but she makes a boat, an ark to carry him, you know, remember? And, and God providentially works it out so that Pharaoh's daughter goes down to the Nile to bathe and sees this little, sees the boat, comes over, it's a little Hebrew baby. Who's watching behind in the bulrushes there? Yeah, Moses' sister, being at the right place at the right time. And, and she sees Pharaoh's daughter loving on that baby. So she runs up, do you need a, a Hebrew mom to take care of, to nurse? And she says, yeah. So Moses goes back to, to mom and dad to be nursed until he's able to come to Pharaoh's court. And he becomes the daughter of, of the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
And he's raised for 40 years with all the luxury and the benefit and the blessing, the bounty of Egypt. We've already told you, it's the powerhouse at that time. And what is it? Um, the phrase, spared nothing? You know, Jurassic Park doesn't have a new one. What's the guy keep saying in that thing? Someone say it loud. Spared no expense. Remember? Never, never mind. You, it, there was no expense wasted on Moses. Moses has everything. He's trained. He's educated. He's skilled. He's taught war and weaponry and athletics and probably different languages and, and fed the best stuff for 40 years. He grows up as a grandson, in essence, to, to, to Pharaoh. Only God, you know? Um, but something happens. Verse, you know, 10 through 15. I, I can't remember. Mindy, do you have starting in verse 10 next? Yeah, let's turn to Exodus 2, verse 10. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, and said, because I drew him out of the water. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up, Nothing else is told to us about that until you get to the New Testament and it talks about how God treated and raised him and he eventually got to this point where he didn't want to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He wanted to unite and be with his people. God's calling in his life was evident and he was responding and that's taking place in verse 11. Not very many details are covered in the historical narrative that we have because by verse 11 he's 40 years old. It came about in those days when Moses had grown up, that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he feels with them, and he anoints. God's working in his life to draw him, to prepare him for a, a, a task to serve God. And God's already equipped him in ways that Moses might not have fully understand it, understood at this point. And he relates to this Egyptian as being too hard on one of his Hebrew brothers. And I love what it says in verse 12. So he looked this way and that. Don't you love the details that are... Now, don't misunderstand. Who did we say is writing it from a human perspective? Don't you think he remembered that years later? Jeepers, you remember that day? Man, God was drawn. I felt with the brethren. Man, I'm seeing this. But I'm for anybody that way? Anybody that way? It's all clear. He kills the Egyptian. Nobody's going to know. Right? Verse 12 says, when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. He buried him. He went out on the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. This is brother against brother. I mean, not in the true family, but they're the family of God. You know what I mean? The nation of Israel. They're fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And he must have, you, you knew him. I looked that way. No one saw they saw. Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. Look at verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh, settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. If you were to continue to read through Exodus, you're going to find that Moses is going to go out to the wilderness, to Midian, and to sit at a well, he's going to meet his wife, water the camels, help with all that kind of... God providentially leading and directing, Moses responding, he's going to come to the family, he's going to eventually get married there, and he's going to be a shepherd for the next 40 years in Midian. He's 40 about now, he's going to be out on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. He's been pre prepared by Egypt for 40 years. He's going to be prepared by God for 40 years. God was preparing him through Egypt too. But do you see the mix as God's bringing this leader for his people to rescue him? He's going to take care of the flock for his dad and things. And, and that's what's going to take place. Look at, and so he's there for 40 years um, away from the people. 
taking care of the, the flocks in chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Anybody know another name for that mountain? Wow. Did you just get goosebumps? So, you shouldn't there. Sinai, something else is going to happen at Sinai eventually. And, and that's where God brings him. He's at the mountain Horeb. Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is to Moses in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not being consumed. Right? It, it's burning. It's on fire, but it's not taking away the, the bush. It's not, it's not deteriorating. So Moses said, I got to go turn and see what it's there. It's not being burned up. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Wow. God is right there in this manifestation of his presence in a fire that's not consuming the bush. And he's telling him, it's holy. Get rid of the sandals. This is a holy sanctuary place. And, and, and Moses does that. And, and he said to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. He was seeing... Not as full glory as you read later. You never can see that and live, but the manifestation of God's presence. And God says in verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, Hittite, Amorite, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite. Again, I always say that, just notice as you're reading through here, he lists those people because those are the people God is going to tell him to come in and destroy. And he's writing it just a few months before they've got to go do that. They've got to see God's hand there. And... I've heard the cry, the oppression, the Egyptians are oppressing me. We're, we're running out of time. I, I was kind of glad to see you run out of time a little bit too, Nate, every once in a while up here. Um, you know, God's going to call them out. He's going to lead Moses to go back. You've read it yourself, how God's going to say, I'll do these things. Moses says, I can't, I'm not able. And God says, I never said you were. I'll be with you. I'm the one that's going to do it. Remember, it's God that's going to do it through Moses. He's prepared him for 80 years for this task to go redeem his people, to rescue him from slavery, to, to be the agent, the, the leader that brings redemption of God's people. 70 men went down there 430 years later, two to three million are going to be led out by God. And Moses says, I can't. And he says, I know, but it's me through you. Trust me. And, and eventually he says, I can't speak. I stutter. He says, well, your brother, I'll let him talk. And he prepares Moses to go back. Remember, Moses says, who am I going to say? What am I going to say is your name? And he says, I am that I am. It's the verb to be that God exists and he always exists. I am and I will be. The, interesting to think of God in those terms that he always has been. And, and the, the idea of Yahweh and Adonai being combined by the Masoretes who wrote the text because they couldn't pronounce Yahweh. There are no vowels in it, so they wouldn't. So they take the, the idea of Adonai, which means Lord, and put those vowels in. So it comes up with Yehovah. I am that I am. And, and he's telling them to go back. He goes back to his people. You see, I'm kind of in the rush mode right now. Um, he goes back to, because I'm sure I've got stuff clear into chapter 12 for Mindy. And, and we need to at least touch about 12 because it's something very significant to, to what we're going to do, what we're going to remember today. Anybody know what might be in Exodus 12? Uh, Passover. God raises them up, sends them back. The, the leaders believe. 
But Pharaoh doesn't. It just gets harder and harder. And I love that. You know, God has something beautiful planned for his people. And it's become kind of hunky-dory for 425 years. I don't know how long. But he made it hard for a while so they should want to leave. Do you know that? That's important. He already knew I'm going to do it, but if he came in there living in the lap of luxury, hey, later, Lord, I'll do it down the road. Wait till the commercial. Wait till... Do you know? It makes it hard, so they want to go. And you know what he does? He does these miraculous events before Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. We call them the ten plagues, right? And you can read that. And honestly, I didn't give her those chapters. There was no way we were going to do that. You've read that. You can study those yourself, but you can see each of those plagues show God's authority over one of the Egyptian deities that they worshipped. Each one shows his authority and his power over them. Initially, those things impact everybody and his magicians do something similar to it and Pharaoh's not moved. But eventually, it starts being selective and it's only getting the Egyptian people and the Hebrew people aren't experiencing it. You get what I mean? And, and you can see the Egypt's being ravaged by God. And, he's, and Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He's not responsive. And then you come down to the last plague and that's where we need to at least look because this plague is the only one that requires Faith on the part of God's people. Everything else, they're just experiencing it as it goes. They're watching their neighbor Egyptians getting destroyed. You know, and Pharaoh's, it's, it's just happening over and over. The people of Egypt are going to want to push them out so much so that they're going to say, here, take my gold, my silver. My, they're going to be plundered like God promised hundreds of years before. This is the miraculous working of God. And you come to this last one, the death of the, the firstborn, the, the, the death angel. Remember, it's the, the last plague. And this one's going to require some faith and some obedience on God's people. The, the instructions are given in, in, in chapter 12 of Exodus, that, that first Passover and what they need to do. They need to take a spotless lamb or a goat, watch it for two weeks, make sure it's no blemish, no infirmities, no problems. And then at twilight, they're supposed to slay that and take its blood of the spotless lamb and put it on the, the lintel of the door and the doorposts. And then they're supposed to eat it with bitter herbs in there under the protection of the blood. Are you getting this, folks? The, this beautiful picture of this feast called Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and God's plan and the preparation, the details are given in, in chapter 12 here. And this unblemished, spotless lamb, his blood is shed for the protection so that the death angel will pass over those. But folks, you could have known all about that. And unless you take God at his word and do what he says, respond in faith, believe him. You can know all about Jesus' sacrifice for you today. You might have been here for weeks on end. Maybe it's your first time and it's starting to, but you don't need to just know about it. You need to respond in faith. You need to say, I need to be rescued. I need to be delivered. I need what only God can give me. That's what it was for the Hebrews. And the beauty is those that took him at his word and did what he said and placed the blood there, the death angel passed over them. But all the other firstborn sons died. No wonder Pharaoh says, get out of here. Get out of here. And I love in chapter 12 as God instructs them how to eat it. You don't have time to put leaven in it. You can't let the bread rise. I'm going to do what I promised. I'm getting you out of here. So they don't even put the leaven in the bread. It's significant in many ways, which we can't talk about right now. But the one thing is you don't have time to let it rise. 
You got to be ready. You eat it with your sandals on, which was unusual in a Hebrew home. Those were always off. But the sandals on and your tunic, your robes laced up around your belt, ready to go. That was a step of faith. God's getting us out of here tonight. I'm trusting you. I put the blood there. I believe what you say. My faith is in you, not in my good works, my ceremonies, my taking of this, that, or the other. It's in you and you alone. And I'm going to eat it ready because I'm going to take you at your word and we're getting out. And that's exactly what happens. As we take this, you can get this ready. But as we do, I'm going to read something. You see, the picture there is so graphic for us. The spotless lamb who sheds his blood and, and the people trust in that because that's what God said. In Luke chapter 22, this is what we read. And, and I'm going to read it. You don't have to turn to it. You can take this and you can take that first little layer off. It's not all the way down or you'll do what I usually do and get the juice exposed. But the first layer gets the, the wafer exposed. Get that while I'm reading something hundreds of years later is going to take place in Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to start reading here in verse 7. This is when Jesus is here on earth. Luke 22 verse 7, then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jump down to verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table, the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus knew why he was here. His worldview was God's worldview. His mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. To redeem us to willingly choose to die in our place before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never, verse 16, eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 17 says, and when he had taken a cup, he, and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do you see what he's saying? He's tying himself to that Passover lamb who shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. He is the ultimate fulfillment of what they looked forward to for hundreds of years. He came and fulfilled it as the lamb without sin who willingly died in our place and rose again three days later. And that's why when we take this, it's not a religious ceremony to earn God's favor. Just like in the Old Testament, it wasn't keep the commandments and you'll win his favor. It was by grace through faith. It was the gift of God. The, the beauty of this is God is redeeming his people from slavery just like it, it is for us. The slavery of sin holds on to us, folks. And Jesus is the only way to be rescued, to be delivered, because he willingly died for you and for me. And he wants us to not forget that. To let that be the lens through which we see our life. To let it shape our world's view, our decisions, our values, our priorities. Don't take this for granted. Don't take it lightly. Don't use it to earn my favor. It can't. We do it to remember. And so I challenge you, if you've never trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord, right now we're going to just bow our heads and, and just have a time of examination right before we take the bread. If you've never trusted him and God's drawing you and convicting you right where you sit, just admit, I need you, God. I've sinned. I've, I've been selfish. I've been full of pride. I've been independent. I, whatever, I... I've fallen short of your glory, God, and I humbly admit that right now. And right now, I believe the only way to be forgiven and made right is to put my faith in Jesus to rescue me. Just tell him that right there in your mind, in your heart as you're talking to him. I believe Jesus died and rose again for me. I'm depending on him. I believe. Right where you sit, call out to him. Just say, come into my life and forgive me. 
Cleanse me. Make me brand new. Rescue me. Be my Lord and Master. God's word says if you express that to him from your heart, you've received the greatest gift of all, eternal life through faith in Jesus. You don't earn it. It's a gift by God's grace. Folks, for those of us that know him, let's let this time challenge us to see our world through the lens of his word and base our values and our goals, our priorities on what matters to him. Let's thank him. Father, we pray your blessing on this time. Draw us to Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And that's what the cup reminds us, that he willingly took our place and paid for our sins. Thank him, and let's do this in remembrance of him. Folks, as we close this thing, let me just challenge all of us as we close. God's providential care, you meant it for bad, but God used it for good. Do you believe that? Man, it's so true. Trust, faith, patience. It's all in his time. Do you realize in four years we'll celebrate this nation's 250 years of independence, right? Right? I think it's 2026. It'll be 250 years since 1776, right? They were in Egypt for 430 years. We don't have anything written about it. Patience. It's all in his time. Waiting and resting, believing you are God. When, call, when God calls, friends, when he's drawing you to serve, to trust, to obey, when, when, when you're sensing that, respond like Moses did. Maybe not with all the questions, I can, I can't. And if that's okay, if as long willingly we surrender, he might be drawing you to service, to ministry, respond to that calling. You see, he uses hardship, difficulty to, to make them want to want what God wanted, to want to go. The hardship is tough, but he still uses it. He doesn't waste it. It's for our good. Don't miss this. He's the God of miracles. The God that reigned in Moses' day is just the same today. There's an old song that says that. He can do anything but fail, friends. Humbly worship him. We didn't read those, but that's how they responded. Redemption wasn't earned, but it was by grace through faith. Pictures we see. Father, we just need you to keep working in our lives. Thanks for this time together to remember Jesus. Thank you for the history of how you worked thousands of years before. Thank you for your faithfulness, your power. You are God. May we rest in you. May we get to know you better. May we trust you more, rest in you, find you to satisfy and meet our needs. And may you get glory out of our lives however you see fit. We surrender to you, our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Pray in your name. Amen. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.